started a series a couple of weeks ago, and the series that I've been dealing with is uh, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Amen. And we have come to the conclusion that a lot of people really don't know who Jesus is. They uh, think that they know, and you know, even Christians, uh, that many Christians don't know uh, who Jesus is. Now, I kind of took an unofficial poll the other night, uh, people who were here at the church, and I asked uh, one question, and or actually made a statement. And the statement that I made and passed out on a little piece of paper and asked people to uh, write either true or false. And the statement that I put forth was the first appearance of Jesus Christ in the Bible is when he was born in the manger. So that was the first question. So I said, write true if that's a true statement or false if that's a false statement. Well, I just want to let you know that uh, two-thirds of the members got it right. Two-thirds said that uh, that is a false statement, that Jesus, his first appearance was not in the manger. Now, it concerns me. <laughs> that a third of the members said that that was a true statement. So uh, we see, and, and I want to say this, that I know when I began this Christian journey, and I read about the references to the Lord in the Old Testament. You know, I always thought that that was uh, God the Father. And that's what I always uh, believed and I held to that. As I studied, I, I, I saw that there was another uh, being that kept manifesting itself, and, and that was the angel of the Lord. And I used to think that either that was the Lord or that was just a messenger from God. But as I studied it out, and I'm going to present this thesis to the congregation today, and that is that Jesus Christ was present long before he was born in Bethlehem's manger. That Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord. And so we're going to look at that today, and for some of you who are looking at me with a strange eye, it's good because then that means that you'll pay attention for the whole sermon. <laughs> all right? Uh, others of you who, it's, it's just like I, I, I tell people all the time, you know, sometimes when I'm preaching, uh, people fall asleep. And I, I was preaching one time, and uh, God fell asleep and he started snoring. And his wife went like that, got my attention, said, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, this, this guy's snoring. And I said, well, go ahead and, and nudge him and wake him up. And she said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> so I tell people that I, I, I don't mind if people go to sleep. Because if you go to sleep, all that's saying is that you trust you. That you say, well, you know, I know what pastor's saying is all right, and, you know, we know that he's straight, so praise God. You know, it's the ones that stay awake that I worry about. <laughs> so you want to stay awake today, make sure you hear uh, what I'm saying. But uh, there was a series that was out a couple of years ago. Many of you probably remember uh, watching it. It was called Touched by an Angel. And so the title of my message this morning is Touched by the Angel. Not touched by an angel, but touched by the angel. And we want to deal with this thought that Jesus is the uh, angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Father, we come to you today. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ, who we have been celebrating all morning. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for him. And now, Lord, as we come to look at your word, uh, we invite the congregation to come and dine, the master's calling to come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine. Come and dine, the master's calling. Come and dine. Feed us, Lord, from your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we think about this whole idea of God appearing in the Old Testament, uh, we have what's known as a theophany. And the word theophany comes from two Greek words. Uh, you all know the Greek word for God is theos, all right? So it comes from theos and then phino, which means to appear. And so what we have when we talk about a theophany, 
and as you read theological books, you will see this word theophany appear over and over again. And the word theophany, basically what it means is an appearance of God. So if, if God uh, decides to take on some physical form and manifest himself, then that is what's known as a theophany. Well, in the Old Testament, there were many appearances by this angel of the Lord. And this angel of the Lord, many believe that is Jesus Christ. And we know uh, from studying New Testament scriptures, John 1.1, 1, 1, Philippians chapter 2, Colossians 1, and Colossians 2, that Jesus Christ claimed, not only claimed to be deity, but he also proved that he was deity. And so what we have under consideration this morning is not a theophany, but what we call a Christophany. And so a Christophany would be an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. That is what a Christophany is. As we think about the appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, I want to look at four vignettes or four stories this morning as we look at this angel of the Lord. And then I want to draw some conclusions about the angel of the Lord and prove to you that uh, this is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The first vignette that we want to look at is found in the book of Genesis, if you would turn there. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. And we all remember the story from Sunday school about Abraham and how that him and Sarah were without child and they wanted to have a child. So Sarah employed her handmaid, Hagar, to have a child for Abraham. And as a result of that, some tension grew, and Sarah actually had Hagar put out of the home. And here in Genesis chapter 16, we find Hagar in the wilderness. And as she is in the wilderness in Genesis chapter 16, let's begin reading in verse 7. It says here, and right away, what are we faced with? And the angel of the Lord, right there, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, Sarah, Sarah's handmaid, from where came of thou and where thou goest? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarah. And the angel of the Lord, here we go again, that term, angel of the Lord, said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of his brethren. And she, Hagar, called the name of the place who spoke to her, Thou, God, seeth me. For she said, I also, I also here have seen him that seeth me. She called the name of the place Jehovah El Roy. The God that sees me. And so this angel of the Lord saw her. When she was all alone and when she was in need, that Jesus Christ came alongside of her. And I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you feel lonely. Maybe you feel all by yourself. Hagar, who the only support that she had was Abraham and Sarah was kicked out of their home and led to flee in the wilderness and so she was alone and in need. And here comes the Lord. And he told her that don't worry about everything, that you will have your son, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to make sure that things are right. And as she sits back, what does she say? Thou God who sees me. What a blessing it is that God sees us. No matter what we go through, God sees us. No matter what peril we find ourselves in, God sees us. 
that we are never alone. The songwriter put it like this. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches over me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the little bitty sparrow. That this angel of the Lord came and abode in her presence and let her know that everything is going to be all right. And again, maybe your heart is burned down and maybe your heart is troubled. I don't know how many people I talk to that experience loneliness and they confess the fact that they are, are lonely and they need somebody to come alongside of them. But let me tell you something. As long as you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are never alone. That he's always with you. He always comes alongside. And so we see in this first vignette that the angel of the Lord is the Lord God who sees. The second thing that we see about this angel of the Lord and again, we go back to our Sunday school lesson. And in our Sunday school lesson, we remember that God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, the son that he had waited for so long for, the son that he prayed for and that he trusted God for. God said, take your only son up to Mount Moriah and offer him up as a sacrifice. And so Abraham takes his servants, he takes his son, he takes the wood, he takes the knife, and he comes to the bottom of Mount Moriah, and he tells the servants, wait here. Now, I, I like the thing uh, that is said, and you can only pick this up in the Hebrew, because in the Hebrew, when Abraham tells the servants to wait there, what he says, he says, you wait here. He says this, for me and the land, we will go up. Me and the lad, we will worship. And me and the lad will come back. So he had the assurance that God was going to work something out. And as he goes up and he ties his son Isaac to the altar and he raises his knife in the air, we see that he's about to take his son's life. And then we see in Genesis chapter 22, if you'll turn there. Genesis chapter 22. In verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood on in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar with the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Uh-oh, wait a minute. We got this guy again, right? We got this guy showing up again. Coming again. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand unto the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. That is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh. We all know what that means. The Lord 
will provide. God will provide. That whatever you're dealing with, God has the answer. God has the need. And he already has thought through it and already has met that need. I always say that where God guides, he provides. Where he leads, he feeds. And where he directs, he protects. God always has a ram in the bush. I remember when I was in seminary, and on many occasions, we ran out. And we would always get down. I remember on one occasion that, uh, and I had, at the time, I had two children. And we were uh, about ready to eat on a Saturday night, and all we had was some green tomatoes. And I remember my wife. She was uh, inventive, ingenious, creative, and she took those green tomatoes, that's all we had. And she dipped them in some flour and some uh, seasoning, fried them up, and we sat there that night, and all we had to eat was green tomatoes. And the next day, I was uh, working with a little church way out in the country down in Virginia. And after uh, church, one of the couples took us out to eat. And we went out to eat, and they brought us a dinner, and we had steak and potatoes. And I told my wife, I said, sometimes it might be green tomatoes, and other times it might be steak and potatoes. But God is good, and God will provide. He will provide all of our needs. See, sometimes it's just like I heard one lady say, that, that we got this string, and that uh, we work our way all the way down to the string, and just when we're about to get to the end of the string, God ties another one to keep us going. God will provide. He will take care of you. David said, I've been young and I've been old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor see begging bread. I said it once, I'll say it again, but I've never seen anybody trusting God standing down at the poorhouse. What is the poorhouse? I don't know. I've got to ask my dad. He'll straighten that out for me when I get to heaven. He'll tell me what the poorhouse is. But uh, I would imagine that the poorhouse is, is one of those things that uh, you don't know what it is, but you know when you're in it. <laughs> you don't know what it is, but you know when you're there, right? And, and, and so uh, if we trust God, God will provide. Just like he provided for Abraham. And, and you know, when you think about uh, this right here, uh, the, the beauty of this is that Abraham believed that God was going to provide a sacrifice. First of all, he said, me and the lad, we will go, we will worship, we will come back. So he believed that God was going to provide a sacrifice. But you know what? And I don't have time to, to turn there this morning, but if you really want to read something powerful, go to Hebrews 11. Because in Hebrews 11, you know what it said? It said that Abraham believed that even if he would have killed his son, that God was going to raise him from the dead. It said that Abraham had that belief that if he'd have took that knife and that if he'd have drove it through the heart of his son, that God was going to raise his son from the dead. That's how much he believed that God would provide. This angel of the Lord, who is none other than the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The third instance that we see this angel of the Lord showing up, if you'll turn there to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And in Exodus chapter 3, Moses has a confrontation. And the confrontation that he has is with a burning bush. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even under Horeb. Here we go. <laughs> there he go again. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. 
And he said, draw near here and take off your shoes because the place that you are standing is holy ground. Then look what this angel of the Lord says. He says, moreover, he said, I am who? I am God. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The angel appears to Moses. And this angel is the angel of the Lord. And he says that he is the God of his fathers. But then, one of the most powerful things that he says in this passage, in verse 13, Moses asked him, what is your name? That when uh, I go and tell the people that I'm representing you, uh, what is your name? Verse 13, and Moses said unto God, behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and I shall say unto them, the God of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is your name? What shall I say unto them? And God, this angel of the Lord, said to Moses, say that I am, that I am. And he said, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent thee, sent thee unto you. I am. This is a powerful statement. And I, I wish I had time to unpack it. I just don't have time to unpack it this morning. So let me give you the Reader's Digest version of it. The word I am in the Hebrew is known as the Tetragrammaton. And what it represents is the self-existent, the eternal, the almighty, the everlasting God. And so when God says, and, and if you go and you study the phrase in the Bible, I am, just study it out. And basically, the word I am means whatever you need God to Whatever you need, God says, you know, he, he could have said, well, you know, tell them that uh, Jehovah Jireh sent you. Tell them that Jehovah Rapha sent you. Tell them that uh, Jehovah Nisi. He could have went into all these things. He said, but let's just cut to the chase. That when they ask who sent you, just tell them that I am. I am the all-sufficient God. I was meditating as I thought about the I am on this song. And the song says, Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I come. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Then the third stanza of this song says, Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days shall be. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. Jesus, he's all the world to me. That without him, I would fall. In him, I, I live and I move and I have my very being. If he were to withdraw himself from me, whither shall I go? The angel of the Lord came alongside Moses and he said, tell him, that I am have sent you. I am what? I am whatever you need. Whatever you need. And the third, or excuse me, the fourth vignette is found in the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges,
book of Judges, chapter 6. Maybe many of us might not be as familiar with this story as we are with the other stories. But in this story, we see that God calls Gideon to deliver the nation of Israel out of bondage. And Gideon is hiding somewhere. And the Lord comes to him and the Lord says, Hell, Gideon, oh, mighty man of valor. Now, how in the world is it? You're a mighty man of valor when you hide from the Midianites, you know? See, that just goes to let you know that when God gets ready to do a work in your life, man, he going he to he change you. <laughs> and so, Gideon, the Lord tells Gideon, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to use you to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Midianites. And then Gideon asks for a sign. And, and God says, bring an offering to me. And so Gideon brings this offering. And God consumes it with fire. Then Gideon realizes... If we look in, let, oh, let me get to Exodus, excuse me, Judges, chapter 6. Gideon realizes that this angel of the Lord was God. And he becomes so overwhelmed with this thought. Look at uh, verse 21, Judges, chapter 6, and verse 21. And so, verse 21, the angel of the Lord... Here we go again. Showing up again. Put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there arose a fire about the rock and consumed the flesh of the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of the sight, out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O God, for I have seen an angel of the Lord, face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. And unto this day it is yet in Ophrah and the absolutely right. And so we see here, look what Gideon says about this angel of the Lord in verse 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon is just saying that I have seen God. And you know, as you read the Bible, it says that no man can see God and live. And so Gideon thought that he was going to die. And what does the angel do? The angel comes back and he says to Gideon, Peace be unto thee, in verse 23. Fear not. You shall not die. And so God gives him peace in the midst of his fear. That Gideon builds an altar and he calls the name of the place Jehovah Shalom, the Lord who is our peace. What do you have going on in your life right now? All the waters of your life troubled? I want to let you know that there is somebody who speaks peace to your situation. He's able to get up out of the boat and speak peace to the storms in your life and calm those troubled waters. I was watching the news last night, and uh, this is amazing. And I hope I don't offend anybody, right? I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. But what in the world is it deal with this duck down at the point? <laughs>
know, that, that's where I find my feet. That's where I find my head. And Gideon, as, as Gideon was fearful because he thought that his life was over, the angel of the Lord comes back and says, fear not. Peace, be still. Peace in the situation. You know, as I, as I think about our life, in Psalm 46, it, it, it says that, uh, that there's a river. And this river is flowing. And that all around this river, there are earthquakes shaking. There's tornado and hurricane. The wind is blowing. It, 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 there's all type of disasters around this river. And it said that this river just keeps flowing. And that the river, with all this going on around, is undisturbed. There's not a ripple, there's not a wave in the river. And the psalmist says, the reason, because God is in the midst of the river. And no matter what is going on in your life, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the earthquakes in your life, they may be shaking and rattling all around, but let me tell you something, if you just find a way to center yourself in the Lord, if you find a way to just center your life and to center your heart in God, all this stuff happening around you, you'll still have peace because God is in the middle of the river. And so we see this angel of the Lord is a powerful creature, is a powerful being. And he's able to calm people who are fearful. He's able to comfort people who feel alone. He's able to provide for people who have a need. And he's able to be whatever a person needs, this angel of the Lord. As I conclude the message today, I'm here to tell you that the angel of the Lord is none other than Jesus Christ. Now, actually, uh, you know, I'm about ready to finish up another book. And in, and in the book that I'm, I'm writing, I, I, I go into great detail. And I don't have the time to go into detail this morning. So uh, when the book comes out, you're going to have to get a copy of the book. Shameless plug. <laughs> And I go into detail on this, and, and I know I'm, I'm kind of sketching through this, but if you, wanna, if you want the notes, if you want the full notes, I'll, I'll send them to you to, to prove what I'm saying. So I, I want to let you know that this is just not something that I'm shooting off. Uh, first of all, the same designation is given to the angel of the Lord and Jesus Christ. When Samson was born, the angel of the Lord appeared to his parents, or before he was born. The angel of the Lord appeared to his parents and, and, and was talking to him. And Samson's father says, well, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord says, why do you ask my name, seeing that it's wonderful? The same Hebrew word that's used in Judges, where he says that, his name is wonderful. Let's fast forward. Isaiah chapter 9. All right. It talks about Jesus Christ. It says, He shall be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Somebody help me out. Wonderful. The angel of the Lord says, My name is wonderful. The Bible says that Jesus Christ. His name shall be called what? Wonderful. Secondly, Jesus is the only visible manifestation of the Trinity. That when you look at the scripture, we never see a manifestation of God, a, a physical manifestation of God. The only one that we see manifested is Jesus Christ. And when you look at the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is said is compared to wind. 
It says that he's like the wind that moves here and there. Now, we can't see the wind, but we can see the results of the wind. And so the Holy Spirit is like the wind. The only visible manifestation that we have of the Trinity is Jesus Christ. So this angel of the Lord who says that he's what? God. On many occasions. Now, I just showed you four instances in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord said that he was God. Or it was said that he was God. So the only visible manifestation that we have of God, the Trinity, is Jesus Christ. Now, the, the one time the Holy Spirit uh, descends on Jesus and it says like a dove. All right, so that's the only time that we read any indication of the Holy Spirit taking on any type of appearance. But for the most part, the only physical, visible manifestation we have of the Trinity is Jesus Christ. Now again, uh, I'm saying all this, but I can prove it. And you can get the notes back it up. Third, very interesting that this angel is mentioned only in the Old Testament. And after Jesus Christ came, there's no other mention of the angel of the Lord. No other mention. Now, go read the New Testament. We read about all kind of angels in the New Testament. We read about angel after angel after angel in the New Testament. But not one time do you read anything about the angel of the Lord in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, this guy was active. He was always showing up. Why is that? Because when Jesus Christ came, he was the angel of the Lord. And then finally, the angel of the Lord can only be the son. Because the father is the sender. He is the one who sends the Son. And the Holy Spirit, he again is invisible. And so the only logical conclusion that we can draw is that the angel of the Lord is the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus Christ. Now I know I got a little deep this morning, but uh, again, if we, I, I find that people don't understand who Jesus is. And, and, and a lot of people, well, let's put it this way, so hopefully, uh, if you're sitting here today, uh, you got straightened out. If, if you fill out this paper and said that that statement was true. All right. But before today, a third of Bethany members thought that the first time Jesus appeared was in the manger at Bethlehem. Okay? That's a third of a Bible-believing church with a Bible institute. <laughs> Let me let that uh, so, I mean, so it, it, it's obvious that everybody doesn't know who Jesus is. But when we see who he is, and then we see his work, even in the Old Testament, we can take comfort in the fact that when we get up here, the choir sang about him earlier. They sang about Jesus earlier. That this Jesus that we sing about is the one who can supply your all-in-one.